Welcome to the Make Ready with the Experts podcast. I'm your host, Fernando Coelho. We're here at Pantio Studios bringing you the very best from in and around the firearms industry, covering topics like guns, gear, firearms training, self-defense, and so much more. Everything from industry insights about the latest gear and training techniques, to hunting, survival, and empty hands. But this isn't just about the guns, folks. This is about the stories. The military, law enforcement, and civilian stories of heroics protecting our country, fellow citizens, friends, and neighbors. MakeReady.tv is the official website of Pantio Productions and features over 5,000 segments from world-famous instructors. With new video titles added each month, MakeReady.tv is widely known as the Netflix of firearms training. However, we really do go beyond that. We have survival series. We have empty hands. We have edged weapons. We cover armorer skills. We've done documentaries, even medical and hunting. With your subscription, you will have access to an extensive library of videos. To be quite honest, we got a lot. Be sure to visit MakeReady.tv and subscribe today to stream our exclusive content to any device, anywhere, anytime. This is content that just may save your life or the life of someone you love. What you're about to hear is from the Profiles of Courage series of videos available on MakeReady.tv. Our Profiles of Courage are just that profile interviews from our instructors giving us background on who they are, where they came from, and how they became an expert in their field. This episode features Wes Doss and Dave Spaulding. Both have backgrounds in law enforcement. Wes Doss also has a background in military. Wes Doss has a program where he goes around to law enforcement officers around the country offering free training. Now just remember, next time you're taking a class from Wes Doss, bring him a cigar. He loves cigars. Here's Wes Doss. I'm Wes Doss. I uh, grew up in Northern California. I've called Arizona home since 1982. In 1984, uh, I enlisted in the U.S. Army and started what would be uh, overall between active and reserve uh, a 21-year career with the U.S. Army. A lot of people don't really realize, uh, and, and the Army military itself is, is different all the time based on the needs uh, of the country and the, and the needs of the organization. Uh, you don't always get the job you want, and the, the job you want isn't always, always available. Uh, when I first raised my hand, uh, I went into the infantry. Uh, the first couple of years, I was a, just a straight leg grunt infantry soldier uh, who re-enlisted to go into the military police corps because I wanted a career field that I thought would translate at some point in time into a civilian career field. I'd always had a, an interest in law enforcement. Um, the training that I got was, by and large, uh, the best criminal justice training I'd ever had. I mean, I've, I've taught academies. I've, I've been a part of a number of academies. Um, the unfortunate side of it was is that the Army has taken very little steps to have anything that they do certified outside of the Army. So a lot of people don't really recognize what takes place in the military. And so it, 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 while it was good, it was good experience, it, it didn't really translate into anything. Now, fortunately, my last uh, four years of active duty, I uh, finished out my associate's degree and I went into what at the time was called the uh, CID apprentice program. And the CID at the time was a homogenous branch that uh, was the senior criminal investigative organization that the Department of the Army had. It was uh, kind of like the Army's version of the FBI. And, you know, we, we were told, you know, your opportunities exist. You know, you've got the opportunity to go to Scotland Yard. You've got the opportunity to go to the FBI Academy. There's, there's duty assignments at all these locations. And unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, uh, I uh, ended up getting involved in doing uh, the Army's uh, protective service work through the Protective Services Battalion based out of Fort Belvoir. And uh, that's pretty much what I did the entire time. So I had uh, constituents that I went to school with that certainly got those choice duty assignments. I got to go to shooting schools and, and, and other things and, and do uh, protective work uh, leading into the first Gulf War. 
During the first Gulf War, uh, you know, it was based on, on our details and, and who we were assigned to and, and our functions, you know, our offices were based out of Germany and we would spend you know, sporadic periods of time with either chiefs of staff or, or general officers in theater. Um, when the Gulf War ended, um, I got reassigned to another duty location, and I'd, I'd, been, I'd been deployed from an overseas assignment. So uh, my family, my, my wife and my daughter at the time, uh, our first child, were stuck uh, overseas. It was a typical snafu. And it, while it didn't last for very long, the separation didn't last very long, it, it created enough turmoil, created enough stress that we made a family decision, and uh, I acquiesced, and I, I, go ahead, I went ahead and, and ETSed out of the Army. Um, the funny part was um, when I processed out, uh, I processed out at the Presidio in San Francisco, and it, which was cool. I mean, I'm from Northern California. I, I, I thought, wow, this is great. I get to go to the Presidio, check this place out. Um, when we left the base after, after we had finally processed out, uh, we're on a bus with a, a bunch of other folks that had ETSed out, and as soon as it cleared the gate of the Presidio, everybody was cheering. And I'm the one guy on the bus that that, that started crying. Um, for me, that separation was one of the most dramatic separations of my life. I mean, it was like a family member had died. And I didn't like it. Um, and it was, a, it was a rough adjustment. I, I, I found out that the world outside of the military was filled full of people that uh, didn't say what they meant, uh, didn't do what they said. Um, it was just a different place. And even though, even though my field that I was involved in had me more civilianized than, than, than other soldiers, um, it just, it just, I don't know, it was just strange. So my wife knew this and uh, again, she, she gave in to me and allowed me to go back into the National Guard. And I, I spent a number of years in the Arizona National Guard uh, before uh, an opening uh, uh, came about in a unit in Las Vegas. And I went from there to the Army Reserve, where I finished my time out, uh, retiring out in 2006 through the Army Reserve. So immediately following uh, the Gulf War, uh, Desert Storm, uh, when we, I got out, I uh, came back to Arizona. You know, it's where you have roots at. And uh, started applying to a number of law enforcement agencies uh, all over the state, um, out of state, you know, trying to see who was going to bite first. And ultimately, I was picked up by uh, the county sheriff's department in the county where I reside and went off to the academy. And at the time, uh, we had you know, a number of academies in the state, but this was the senior academy in Tucson. Uh, and uh, it was a good experience. It was a resident academy. It was like being back in the military again. It was very regimented. Uh, we were in, in barracks. Uh, we have you know, the typical details, whether it was cleaning or maintenance that we had to do, as well as our homework. It was, it was almost like taking a step back in time. And uh, I spent uh, my time with the sheriff's department you know, concurrently while I was in the Army Reserve. Uh, and I filled a number of voids at the Sheriff's Office. I, uh, I started out in patrol, as everybody does, and because of my experiences in the military, uh, I was, uh, I elevated quickly out of patrol into our uh, detective bureau, where I spent seven years in detectives before promoting back out and going back to patrol. And, and in detectives, I, I had a, an opportunity to do a number of things. I mean, I worked everything. We had general investigations in our, in our unit. Um, everybody had a specialty, but uh, we all worked whatever came in the door. And we had a pretty heavy acti activity level. I carried anywhere from 19 to 20 caseload, uh, cases at a time. So it was, you, were, you were staying pretty busy. Um, so I'm working everything from you know burglaries up to homicides. So it, it was interesting, good learning lesson. Uh, while I was uh, doing that, I had peripheral duty as a firearms instructor and a defensive tactics instructor in my department. And I was also the training uh, coordinator as well as the team leader for our tactical operations unit, which is what we refer to our SWAT team as. I started my company, Kyber, uh, while I was still active with the Sheriff's Office as well as the Army Reserve. And it was, it was fairly slow. It was, you know, I'm typically the local guy doing firearms training, um, a, a branching out a little bit to some neighboring jurisdictions. So I, I didn't put a lot of effort into it. It was, it was mostly kind of a, a, a part-time function, you know, like a hobby that we were just kind of bringing to light. When I retired, um, I got hired by the Six Hour Academy and I drove a 1988 Ford Bronco with 35-inch tires and a six-inch lift uh, all the way from northern Arizona to uh, Epping, New Hampshire. So uh, about $1,000 in gas, and four days later, I'm at the SIG Academy. And uh, it, that was my first real uh, exposure to the, uh, the private industry. 
Yeah, I mean, I'd been a, an NRA staff instructor for the law enforcement division for a while, but this was my first taste of, of, of pretty much the big leagues. And uh, I learned a lot at SIG. It was a great, a great learning opportunity. Uh, the problem was is the lifestyle between uh, where we live and New Hampshire is a little bit different. Um, where we live in Arizona, we're uh, just quickly outside of the area of Las Vegas, Nevada. So it's a, it's a very uh, hustling and bustling, high speed uh, kind of environment. And when I flew my wife out to Manchester, uh, in, like in January or February, uh, leaving the 80 degree temps in Las Vegas to the freezing temps in New Hampshire, she wasn't really thrilled. Um, so I, I had a hard time getting her to, to consider moving to, uh, to New Hampshire. And, and that ended up uh, becoming a decision to come back to Arizona and uh, put some energy back into Kyber. I, I took on some other roles. I've worked for a number of other companies uh, in the course of, of putting Kyber back on its feet. Um, we ran uh, some contract programs on uh, for other companies, both stateside and overseas. Um, and then eventually we got our legs underneath us and started to kick Kyber into high gear. While I was bringing my company back, I, I took on some peripheral duties uh, in the commercial side of the house. I was working for Crimson Trace, uh, where I, I was contracted for a number of years as the training director. Um, I was then brought on at Brownells and I helped stand up the law enforcement program at Brownells and, and the training programs at, at the range. Um, and I've worked with a number of other manufacturers in a training or marketing capacity since then. Meanwhile, uh, elevating my own company and, and getting more legs in, uh, underneath it and, and creating its own footprint. I guess it's fair to, to, to kind of give you the, the, the lowdown on Kyber. Um, Kyber is a, a, a really specialized uh, emergency response training and research company um, that we have traditionally catered to the law enforcement and military market um, with, a, with a spattering uh, on the commercial side, on the civilian side. We do a little bit more now than we have in the past. Um, and we, we become known for uh, the initiatives that we've created. Um, several years ago, uh, we started a trade show function called the One Inch to 100 Yards Warrior Conference that uh, was, was actually a pretty substantial training conference and trade show. Uh, in the last five years, we uh, initiated a, uh, an initiative called the Light Sights and Lasers U.S. Tour, which is a truly a unique program. It is the, uh, the only touring initiative that travels the country, uh, providing uh, cost-free training to law enforcement, military, and then trainers that are within that industry. Um, it's uh, it's sponsor-driven, so we work with a, a, a number of manufacturers on this, but it's, it's to address some of the shortcomings in training as well as some of the budget cuts in training and to provide some folks with enhanced training that many of them don't generally have access to. And uh, it's, it's been, it's been a, a whirlwind trip, uh, and it's, it's been a success. It's, it's been a lot of fun. We've reached several thousand students um, and you know, several thousand departments all across the country from as far away as Alaska and Hawaii. So we, we've got a pretty good growing footprint in that capacity as well. You know, futures are always kind of speculative. You know, it's, it's to say, you know, what my future plans are, are, are always based around the trends of our industry. And, you know, training has become a pretty competitive field. Um, as a guy with a, uh, uh, an advanced degree, and, and I don't, have done a lot of teaching at that level, um, as well as what we do with our own company, I, I'm, I'm always taken back by sometimes the, the, the well intentions, but sometimes the lack of instructor capabilities. I mean, it's not that there, there's people that can't do it, it's that they, they haven't had the where for all given to them to do it. And I think what I'd, I'd like to start transitioning into are more in, instructor development programs to try and help make instructors better instructors. Not necessarily trying to create uh, a group of minions uh, or, or, or you know, have people buy into my own doctrine. I mean, this is simply information that's based on tried and true techniques and tried and true philosophies to try and get people to, to you know, take the, their career uh, to heart a little bit more than they do. I mean, from my perspective, because we've been so intently focused on on our professional side of the house, our law enforcement, our military officers. These are people that, that whether their skill sets are high or their skill sets are low, are p folks that sit in the capacity to be the ones most likely to have to use force in very arduous conditions. And they need the best training they can get. And I, I know I can't provide training to everybody. I don't, I don't want to be everything to everybody. Uh, but I'd like to see instructors 
have a better understanding of human performance. I'd like to see instructors have a better understanding of, of uh, the kinesics, a better understanding of, of physiology, and be able to teach people based on you know, these tried and true uh, ideas and, and elevate themselves, you know, elevate the position of the instructor. I think that's where I'd like to start taking things. Our streaming video subscribers of MakeReady.tv will now get exclusive access to the video versions of our podcasts. In addition, subscribers will have access to our episodes before they air on iTunes or any other free platform. Be sure to visit MakeReady.tv and subscribe today to stream our exclusive content to any device, anywhere, anytime. like to give a shout out to one of our key sponsors, Walther Arms. We've had the pleasure of working with the folks at Walther on numerous projects. They've been a supporter of ours and we love what they make. Heck, we've even been out to their factory in Elm, Germany and had a chance to look you know, behind the curtain and see what they have in the works and gotta admit, pretty impressed. So, thanks to the folks at Walther, we have a discount code for you. Just visit shop dot waltherarms.com looking for some clothing save 20 percent off use the code make ready during checkout okay that was wes doss now we move on to dave spaulding dave spaulding is another longtime friend i've known dave oh geez since the mid 90s uh, when i was in the ammo business and together we can mock each other left and right to the point where we will actually get, we'll run out of things to say. Actually, no, we never really do run out of things to say. We keep bragging on each other. That can go on for hours. And if there's bourbon flowing, now mind you, if there's bourbon flowing, that's only on one side. He drinks that Canadian stuff, crown something or other. That's all he drinks. Anyway, here's Dave Spaulding. become a cop because, God, as far back as I could remember, I wanted to be a cop. I find it interesting that we, we call this segment Profiles in Courage because really I didn't do too much courageous. You know, if you look at some of the other Pantio instructors who went to war and did some pretty incredible things, I was just a street cop for 30 years. I had a wide variety of assignments and I enjoyed the heck out of it but I really don't much miss it. Quite frankly, I was kind of invited to retire by the current sheriff at the time who was, how do I say this? He was an ass, but that's water under the bridge. Every day I went to work, I didn't know what was gonna happen. And that was just really appealing to me. I mean, you go out there and for the most of the time, it was just kind of mundane, routine kind of stuff. But you never knew that when you turned that next corner, that there was gonna be some new event. And that right there, that, that unknown, is what made the whole thing exciting. I started out dispatching cars, and then I worked in the jail, because as a sheriff's deputy at the time, we didn't have correctional personnel. Brand new sheriff's deputies worked in the jail for a few years before there was a, a spot available on the street. And I realize now that that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I can remember thinking, ah, oh God, I don't want to be in that jail with those people. But you know, gathering intelligence isn't just for the military. You need to know your opponent. And I look back now and I realize that the time I spent in the jail dealing with these inmates and talking to these people and transporting them to prisons and other institutions, I learned quite a bit about my enemy or the person I was facing. One of the things I discovered is that they don't think anything like we do. They have their own thought process of how this stuff is supposed to be done and how they live their lives and they go about their business, so to speak. And that gave me a distinct advantage that a municipal cop didn't have because he never dealt with them. Once I got out of the jail, I went on the street and really enjoyed that. For a while, I was an evidence technician, what they now call crime scene technicians. 
I was a detective, both property crime and violent crimes. And then uh, um, I got promoted and became the training supervisor, which was probably my favorite position. So for, for five years, I ran the training programs for my agency, and I, I really enjoyed the heck out of that. Uh, I got promoted to lieutenant and ended up running a drug task force for five years that was federally funded. And we literally worked cases from Miami to Seattle. I had federal agents, state agents, local investigators in the task force. And it was an interesting but very stressful time. But it also gave me a, an inside look at the world of narcotics enforcement. And I sometimes wonder how we do it so well because the rules are really stacked against the police as far as trying to build these cases against these people and and do it within the rules so to speak but you know what we we did it we did it well we had a lot of exciting times we kicked in a lot of doors and i guess between my time in swat i spent 12 years in swat and uh with between that and narcotics i did quite a few entries and uh I, i've got a real appreciation for people who have to go in that door and and take that on. I think I did the same thing that every American law enforcement officer does. He goes out there every day, he puts his life on the line, he does the best he can. And I think all this undue attention, you know, towards police shootings, the whole Black Lives Matter thing, and it's not a true representation of what American law enforcement does. American law enforcement goes out there and they truly serve the citizens. They keep those citizens safe. And it's really an underappreciated uh, occupation. Years ago, I was at a training conference and there was a former Soviet soldier there and we got to talking in a bar one night. And he told me that one of the things that really concerned the, the former Soviet Union is they were convinced that every American in the United States had a gun. And when they were trying to think about how they would invade the United States, that was really concerning to them. And the more I think about that, I think that may be the biggest deterrent we'll have to any occupying army is that every American citizen will fight back. And to me, that's a comforting thought. So every American should be a rifleman. But you know what? I think every American should be a pistol or revolver person as well because that's the gun that you'll have with you every day in and out. And I've studied armed conflict, primarily pistol fighting now for about 36 years. And one of the things that I've come to realize is that pistol fights, first of all, are over very quickly. They're over in a matter of seconds. And there's, there's no way to fight your way to a better gun or fight your way to a long gun because it's merely you're walking down the street, you're confronted with a bad guy, you draw a gun, bam, 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 there it is. One or both of you are down. So, the idea that you're gonna seek cover or you're gonna get yourself to a long gun doesn't, isn't borne out by history, it's not borne out by fact. You're gonna start and finish your fight with what you have on your person or you have in your hand. And unfortunately, the handgun is the hardest weapon system to master. And now, after all these years in law enforcement, I now am running a training company that my mission is to help the American law enforcement officer, help the legally armed system, and yes, military members, to defend themselves with a very difficult weapon to shoot. And quite frankly, at the risk of sounding a little bit arrogant, I think I do it very, very well. And I'm looking forward to doing it for a number of years to come. That was Dave Spaulding. And if you really want to know how to shoot through your windshield, whether it's intentional or not, you need to check out Dave's video on vehicle tactics. Thank you for listening to the Make Ready with the Experts podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Visit us at makeready.tv and check out our online library of training content you can't get anywhere else. If you liked this episode, please be sure to subscribe share, and give us a review. We would appreciate your feedback.
I'm Fernando Coelho, president of MakeReady.tv and Pantio Productions. You may know us from our videos, our firearms training, our survival series, and our documentaries. But now you will get the Make Ready experience in podcast form. We all know the movie Black Hawk Down, a film retelling the story of the soldiers who fought against all odds in Somalia in 1993. We are excited to be the only podcast having the true story from a man who lived through the battle. We will be releasing a multi-episode series based on an interview with Paul Howe, a U.S. Army Delta soldier who fought for his life. Today I want to talk with you about our nation's military involvement in Somalia. Dead American soldiers being dragged through the streets of Mogadishu near where the fighting was concentrated last night and early into this morning. Those kids could have been moved five feet to a doorway, had good cover, laid down just effective fire, instead he put them in a straight and undefensible position. Um, and what happens at that point, they stayed there because they're good soldiers and they got hit. I attribute that to uh, lack of leadership. It was a race at that point because you have all the Somalis, the SNA, the militia, racing to get to the helicopter, and you had us racing to get to the helicopter. I'm gonna go through my rifle, go through my shotgun, go through my pistol, you know, knife if I have to, grenades, pick up an enemy weapon, stay in the fight. Those who attack our soldiers must know they will pay a very heavy price. No, they can come from here, they can come from there. I thought we were gonna get overrun. I actually got into a point where I just kind of looking and saying, okay, this is it, let's draw this line in the sand. Anybody crosses that line, they die. 